Hi. Let's get. You know, uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk about downtowns, but I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about what you're deeply connected to, which is the suburbs and how the suburbs and how the regional entity shapes all the opportunities, the economics, the environmental impacts, um, the cultural and uh, innovation centers of our metropolitan lives. And you're not, the, nobody is disconnected. And the, the greatest challenge today is a virus I call sprawl, which is infecting the planet. As we're growing by, three billion in population in cities. The problem is, in many places in the world, and in the yours, sprawl still dominates a very large percentage of how we build communities. And changing that is the fundamental challenge we have. It comes in different forms. Low-income sprawl in the global south is pushing low-income populations to the periphery, where they have less and less access to services and jobs. Not all sprawl is low density. High density sprawl has been happening in China for the last 20 years. It has the same characteristics as our low density sprawl. Isolated uses, isolated people, car dominated environments, and yet it's an average of 10 to 30 stories. So density isn't really at the heart of it. What is? There's a series of design principles that we use that we've been actually developed more for China than here, but I now realize are universal. And a lot of them are going to seem basic to you. But at starting at the top of the list, especially for development across the globe, preservation has to be the first set of thoughts that come to mind. Preserving ecologies and, and important habitats, preserving um, yeah. Yeah, there's, now we're going we're gonna to end with the issue of special interest groups. So <laughs> you can all applaud for the issue that you care about and then realize that you have a big commonality. I mean, if we don't end up with coalitions, we don't end up making any change. And that's really the fundamental message. So I'll just finish my speech now. <laughs> um, maybe there are other... Uh, uh, advocates here. Agrarian landscapes. In China, they don't have enough land to feed themselves. Established neighborhoods. This is the tricky one. If we think about transforming the American suburb, how do we do it as we dance around existing neighborhoods and all the special interests that re reside there? And of course, cultural heritage. Mixed use is something that all planners talk about, but mixed income is a much more difficult phenomenon but it is essential to healthy regions. We cannot isolate the poor, either in particular neighborhoods or in downtown districts uh, or even in new suburban um, low-income sites. The, and also isolating age groups through different housing typologies is another one of the, uh, the, the things that destroy our opportunity for synergy and community. Now, planners. Small blocks, human scale environments, distributing traffic. In the end, uh, a small block urban configuration, and it may be kind of technical and you think it's all a priori, but distributing traffic allows the mix of uses, bikes, pedestrians, and cars, to interact in a healthy way. Consolidating mobility always destroys it. And there's too much of our land, suburban landscape that's shaped around super blocks, one mile grids. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one. I think we all agree. And yet, the biggest challenge in our suburbs is creating walkable environments. How are we gonna do that in environments that for 40, 50 years have been shaped around the car? Bikes. It's much bigger now than bikes. E-bikes, um, uh, scooters. The last mile problem, I think, is largely about to be solved. But it is the major transit trip um, that is still one of our highest uh, and most uh, complex issues to resolve. And so this question of what kind of transit, what hierarchy, what mix, what technology, we really do need a breakthrough in transit uh, if we're going to go to the next stage. 
I've long been the, one of the biggest advocates for light rail. And I, as I travel around the world, bus rapid transit, the most affordable type of transit, uh, is very, very important. But we need something new, something that's cheaper and faster and more attractive if we're really going to transform the way people think about mobility. It's all of the above, but there's a big missing link, and that, that's partly what I'm going to talk about today. Focusing is all about transit-oriented development. And quite frankly, if we don't have fixed routes, we don't have the armature to plan our cities so that density and destinations are coordinated well with our transit network. Um, the problem with autonomous vehicles is that they go anywhere, quite frankly. They are uh, effectively going to be a new lease on life for sprawl. And I can summarize my whole attitude towards autonomous vehicles, which is if you don't like a single occupant vehicles, then you're going to like a zero occupant vehicles even more. Uh, this is the big dilemma. All the trips that are going to take place without anybody in the vehicle, and I'll get into the detail there. Here's the numbers. Uh, there's a lot of of euphoria about uh, AVs because they're supposedly going to be an end to all the, the um, injuries and they're going to enable people who can't move around to move around and they're going to solve our traffic problems. They're not going to solve our traffic problems. They're going to make it worse. They're going to increase vehicle miles traveled. Why? Because of the zero occupant trip. Now, you could get a car to bring you from the suburbs to your job, but then that car is going to go somewhere, probably a longer distance to search for a place to park and wait to pick you up. The same with Uber style uses, the, the shared and the single occupant shared vehicle uh, strategies. Massive increases in VMT. You have peak hour events. Where do those vehicles go in the off peak? Do they just circle? I just read a report that said that it's cheaper for an AV to just continue to drive around at a slow speed than it is to pay for parking. So just imagine that. Um, the bottom line is it's, it's a tool for further disintegration of our communities. Rather than bringing us together and making people really value walkable places where they interact with their community and neighbors, it's going to further isolate people and atomize our urban environment. So. This is the resource we have. It's not downtown, but it's everywhere suburbia USA. It's the arterial network. It's the least favorite place in the suburbs, and yet everybody thinks it's the most essential because all cul-de-sacs lead to collectors and all collectors lead to arterials. You can't go anywhere without getting on an arterial. But this is where we can make the biggest difference, I think. And of course, it's about taking space for transit and it's about converting all that low-rise commercial, which is going to get killed by Amazon anyway, thanks to you guys. Um, but they are dying. The single-story commercial building on, with a surface parking at FAR.2 or whatever it is, is a thing of the past in terms of economic value, in terms of tax base, in terms of community assets. It's worthless. And yet it's a beautiful land bank, and I'll show you how big that land bank is, in which we can transform the suburbs. So BRT is one form of transit that is more affordable. And you may be investigating some here. Of course, the rub is taking space from the arterial, taking space from the precious automobiles. Um, more interesting now is in China, they are already rolling out autonomous buses. And these ones are just guided by lines on the street. But in segregated lanes, they can become a really powerful form of transit because they can travel faster than the surrounding traffic flow. The problem with buses, of course, is not only do you get delays in the stops, but you also get delayed in the traffic. So it's the worst of all worlds. The best of all worlds is a dedicated right-of-way. And we have to take the geography of our cities and suburbs and allocate space to the kind of mobility we want. And actually, it's free. It's already there. It's already in the public domain. Uh, and so it's all about political will. Now, 
The difference between that China bus and these smaller AVs is significant. Because if you think of putting small AVs on a dedicated right-of-way, they can all be express. The algorithms can group a, a, a set of, uh, of origins and destinations in ways that let people travel without any in-between stops. And so the average speed goes way up. The big buses have to go um, stop by stop. So we're seeing this revolution happen. Everybody knows we need a new generation of transit. That transit has to be much more ubiquitous, therefore transit-oriented development. And um, fertilizing our communities with walkable neighborhoods can happen everywhere. So in LA, they voted in uh, tens of billions of dollars of bonds for new freeways and zero, excuse me, new transit systems and zero dollars for new freeways. It's really quite an amazing public policy um, transformation. That's the light rail system. Those are the extensions to the light rail system. That's the commute train network and its extensions. And most significantly, there are the BRT boulevards that are gonna be begin to rehabilitate the armature of that suburban environment. Uh, and then high-speed rail. Now, I put this all up here to show you that I think if we're going to make the, the healthy environmental and social and economic change, we need a whole hierarchy of transit types. Not one will solve it, but there is a big missing one, which is really affordable transit. The bus networks that we look at have about a 20% fare box. 80% of it is pure debt, burden, uh, as a safety net. Uh, on the local communities. We need to find something that solves that problem and makes transit more attractive and less expensive. So we looked in the Bay Area and I said, well, where could we take this idea of putting um, on dedicated lanes small autonomous vehicles, and I call it autonomous rapid transit, ART instead of BRT. Um, and so we did a hypothetical using our uh, computer analytical tools. But you know, your housing crisis, our housing crisis, it's all the same. What we're doing is driving up the cost of living in a profound way for the workforce. That hurts economic growth. I mean, we do lose intel people from the Bay Area all the time because the cost of housing is so high. I suspect the same is happening here. So this is a universal dilemma. Solving both the congestion problem and the housing problem in one, with one strategy, I think is a particularly potent approach. Look at what's happened there. Just uh, in the Bay Area since uh, 05, close to half a million new jobs and only uh, 130,000 units of housing. That's like one third of the housing that we need to satisfy just that job growth. And we were out of balance before then. In Silicon Valley, there are more than 300,000 more jobs than the housing in Silicon Valley can provide. Hence the long commutes. So we took a very symbolic street, El Camino Real, which is what the missionaries used to settle the West Coast. It's the oldest road in, uh, in the Western United States. It's now a horrible arterial. And we said, what if we put ART transit on that street and added housing on all the commercial pro properties. Look at El Camino. That's an environment that you all can picture in your head pretty well. And you know that it's an environment that nobody actually wants to have at, at the heart of their community. So the analytical tools now allow us to look very quickly at all the parcels, identify all the low density commercial parcels, and then give us a number for how much uh, housing we get. And in that 43,000 miles, if we convert the low density commercial to four story housing at around 50 units per acre, plus ground floor shops and businesses at about 0.2 uh, FAR, we get 250,000 units. One street, a quarter million houses. Now, we're never going to get 100%, but even if we get half of it, we have balance the Silicon Valley workforce housing needs. And that middle that the mayor talked about, that middle need of all the other people who work in the area but don't make gazillions of dollars on their, um, oh, the clock's going in the opposite direction, jeez. I thought I was only six minutes into this, sorry. 
we may not get to China today, <laughs> but we can uh, go there another day. Uh, this is El Camino. You know you're in trouble when you can't tell the difference between a parking structure and an office building. Um, and I'm still not sure what that is on the right side there, but it is a, a signature of how bad these environments are. It's 120 feet for those of you who are technical, which is pretty normative. Six lanes, 120 feet. We discovered that in that 120 feet, we could have tree lawns, expanded sidewalks, two bike uh, scooter lanes, retain the goddamn six lanes of traffic, and add in BRT. All in the, just by cleaning up the mess and getting rid of the parallel parking, which really isn't necessary anyway because they all have service parking lots. So what is the parking doing? Um, it's an astounding fact. It's a public resource, that right of way. And the public should be able to use it. When I work in other parts of the world, I say, if only 30% of your population, say Mexico City or even Beijing, have cars, why are you donating 100% of the street to cars? Why not some geographic equity in the way we treat our circulation system? Now, the bus, BRT, or even large buses don't travel as fast. And so I'll get into this idea that if you have these small vehicles, they can skip stop their way. As a matter of fact, they can skip stop by going into oncoming traffic because they can talk to one another. The technology we have, and that luckily um, these tech industries have developed thinking that they're gonna take over the private automobile industry, not realizing that they're really gonna create the next generation of great transit. The numbers look like this. Speed and ridership, standard bus, this is percent increases, 100% on buses, and then the increases up for bus rapid transit and ridership. And what you can see is uh, light rail, bus rapid transit, they do perform in very similar ways, both in terms of speed and in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, ridership. A ART, by the modeling, will ha operate faster, uh, on average around 23 miles an hour, as opposed to 18 miles an hour, which is the average for um, uh, BRT and light rail and down at around 12 miles an hour for standard bus. You can walk faster than you can take a bus in many, many circumstances. But here's the other part, the cost. The fleet cost for, uh, autonomous is the purple at the end, is, is less than um, LRT, but uh, more than anything else because the technology is high, it's electrified. The O&M costs are half. This is a really big thing. The ongoing expense of running these things. Now, there's no question that the bus drivers union is not gonna be happy about this. Uh, but buses aren't going away. This is just another layer of a complex network of opportunities for people. So there it is, 43 linear miles, a quarter million households. Uh, and then we said, well, what if we were to take every arterial in the Bay Area, the inner Bay Area, and convert it? 500 additional miles. And look at what it does to the city centers in Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose. It creates these networks that will bring the suburban energy into the city in a healthy way rather than uh, being carried by cars. The possibilities are really quite astounding, and it's a wonderful thing to contemplate. And we go, of course, from this to this. The outcomes, using our analytics, is say, well, what if we were to, to kind of uh, to develop the region around this model of TOD linear uh, ribbons of density? We would solve this jobs housing crisis. You notice there the county, the three counties that are out of balance on one side of the bay, and then, of course, the housing opportunities uh, diagonal across the bay, too far away. Uh, and, of course, we looked at scenarios where there was a balance between housing and uh, an unbalance. The long and the short is scenario planning is one way that I, I would advocate as getting people to understand the long-term consequences of uh, of the big choices that have to be made, and also a way of building those coalitions. So, if it, you care about land, one scenario, which is business as usual, uh, consumes more than seven times the land area of San Francisco. 
the amount of infrastructure costs obviously goes up the more you sprawl outward. The, uh, the number of vehicle miles per household, which then translates into household affordability, goes way down. Uh, and obviously, the amount of congestion goes way down as VMT per capita goes way down. We can put numbers to all this, and it's important because when people make serious decisions, they need it under the underlayment of, of a true quantitative analysis. But each one of these slides represents a different special interest group that can see common cause, because all the bars go in the same direction. Water, $3,000 of savings per household. In a, in a, now, the Bay Area, I'm not sure what the number is, but California, the median income is 50,000. This is a big number. Uh, and it has a profound impact on the thing we care most about, affordable housing, affordable lifestyles, inclusionary uh, societies. Uh, health, walking, air quality, every way you link it, it goes to it. And then, of course, I haven't even talked about climate change, but there's no question that we really don't have a future unless we attack this at every level. And the most systemic level that we can deal with climate change is how we live and where we live. Then we can start piling on the renewable generators and the conservation measures. I'm out of time, so there's no China. <laughs> look at that. You look at all you're missing here. <laughs> I'll let you fill in the blanks. They are going from this on the right, super block, single use to mixed use. It's a beautiful thing, what they're doing. And the central government in China has now adopted those seven principles. After experimenting with it for seven years, they, eight, eight principles, they now have adopted it at the highest level. And of course, command and control, there's no approval and appeal or litigation of, <laughs> that's going to happen. They're just doing it. Um, so I know there's some attorneys in the room here that will, will not like this approach. but. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, it's not going to happen here. Um, but it's really wonderful how fast the transformations come in China. I just wanted to get to this end point here. Each one of those topics on that screen is a special interest group. A lot of them are departments, different departments in your city agencies. A lot of them are different professions. They're all isolated, and people tend to focus only on their stovepipe. But the network, the way to connect the dots, are through urban form. This is where it all comes together. And unless we think comprehensively, we're not going to come out with the most cost-effective solution, and we're not going to come out with the coalitions that are going to make it happen. Thank you.